Welcome to the final part of Lecture 5. In this final part, we're going to develop a slightly more complex example that we're going to apply dimensional analysis to. It's going to pertain to heat transfer, and specifically heat transfer within a fast breeder nuclear reactor. And we're going to use dimensional analysis to suggest what dimensionless groups govern the problem, to suggest experimental data that we might need to take, and then to construct a correlation that allows us to predict heat transfer coefficients over a wide range of behaviours. We're going to see that the heat transfer correlation that we obtain actually covers more than one regime, and we'll see how we can use the theory that we've learned to date in order to cope with that. So, on the whiteboard I've put the problem statement. A fast breeder reactor is cooled using liquid sodium that runs through vertical pipes within the reactor core. Experiments need to be carried out to determine the heat transfer coefficient between the sodium and the nuclear material. Now, the heat transfer coefficient is a parameter that in effect tells us how fast heat transfer can happen between two different materials. So low heat transfer coefficients mean that there is a poor transfer of heat. High heat transfer coefficients mean there's a very effective transfer of heat, a rapid transfer of heat. So, let's look at the questions that we need to answer. Firstly, find the key independent non-dimensional groups. Second, suggest a relationship between these groups and suggest experiments to do. Third, using experimental data, produce a heat transfer correlation in terms of the non-dimensional groups. So three things to try and work out. We're going to start, as always, with a diagram. So here on the whiteboard is my simplified cartoon of cooling a nuclear reactor. The yellow here is the nuclear material. The pipe in blue is our coolant pipe through which the liquid sodium runs. And so through that pipe, I have liquid sodium. Around that pipe, I have a hot reactor core. Let's look at the parameters associated with the problem. Well, I need to know the heat transfer coefficient, which I've put in red there, which governs how well the heat transfers from one medium to the other. The parameters that I think that are important in governing the heat transfer coefficient is the volumetric flow rate of liquid sodium, the liquid sodium density and viscosity, the heat capacity and thermal conductivity of the liquid sodium, and the pipe diameter. OK, so, first thing to do. Let's find the non-dimensional groups associated with this problem. Let's invoke Buckingham's Pi theorem, first of all, to figure out how many groups we're looking for. We have seven parameters. We have four fundamental dimensions. The three that we've been using all the time, mass, length and time, and a new one, temperature. So, we have four fundamental dimensions, seven parameters, we seek three dimensionless groups. So, let's try and find these dimensionless groups. We've got a fluid mechanics problem. We've got a pipe with liquid flowing through it. The flow regime, laminar or turbulent, is going to be important, and so that is governed by the ratio of viscous to inertial stress. Therefore, we need to find a Reynolds number to explain that physics. So, let's make one of our dimensionless groups a Reynolds number, rho d v over mu. And remember, we haven't got a velocity explicitly in this problem, but we can derive one very easily from the volumetric flow rate Q and the pipe area. So, pi 1 isn't strictly speaking my Reynolds number, it's sort of a modified Reynolds number with respect to volumetric flow rate, rho Q over d mu. Now, heat transfer to you at the moment is probably an unfamiliar subject, so we're going to look in the data book. Page 35. What parameters exist on page 35 of the data book that can help us here? We need something involving a heat transfer coefficient, and if you look through page 35, you will find a Nusselt number, convective to diffusive heat transfer, HD over K. We also need something that involves densities and specific heat capacities, and you'll find the Prandtl number. So, the Prandtl number is mu over rho Cp. So, there are our three non-dimensional groups, Reynolds number, Nusselt number, Prandtl number. We haven't had to revert to first principles derivation. We've used a combination of our own intuition, a fluid mechanics problem, and page 35 of the data book to identify the three groups. So, 
three groups. Now, let's suggest a relationship between these groups. Pi 1, pi 2, pi 3. I need pi 2 to be the subject of whatever equation I form because I want the heat transfer coefficient h, which drops out of the Nusselt number. So pi 2, therefore, I should write as a function of pi 1 and pi 3. Sorry for the typo on the board. And I know that, well, each of the non-dimensional groups need to be raised to its own power, alpha and beta, and a numerical constant will probably be needed as well. Of course, we know actually that is slightly incorrect. What we should actually write is that pi 2 is going to be the additive series of a number of groups that look like the one we just wrote. So c1, pi 1 to the alpha 1, pi 3 to the beta 1, c2, pi 1 to the alpha 2, pi 3 to the beta 2, and so on and so forth. And we need experimental data to highlight whether we need one group, two groups, three groups on that right-hand side. So the experiments we're going to suggest is that Nusselt number is measured experimentally as a function of Prandtl number and Reynolds number. So that's the second part of the question done. Part 1 and Part 2 were the easy bits. Now, let's look at some data. Suppose that our Prandtl number is fixed. If we look at how our Prandtl number is defined, it's mu over rho Cp. It's defined by the material. In this case, for liquid sodium at 400 degrees C, we have a Prandtl number of 0 0.0105. Now, strictly speaking, the Prandtl number is going to be a function of temperature because both density and viscosity will vary with temperature. So we could explore relationships of Prandtl number with temperature. However, for our purposes, we're going to assume that the nuclear reactor operates at a constant temperature. So we'll write that assumption down and we will assume our Prandtl number is fixed. And so all we have to do is look at the relationship between Nusselt number and Reynolds number. And here's some experimental data on the board. The experimental data are the single data points, and what do we see? We see over a range of Reynolds number 10 to 1000 that Nusselt number is pretty much constant. If we look at the y-axis, it's going to be around 5.6, very little variation. So over that range of Reynolds number, we're going to say there is no relationship. Our Nusselt number is more or less fixed and constant, it's around 5.5, between Reynolds numbers 10 to 1000. Think physically. What is the Reynolds number 10 to 1000 meaning in terms of our fluid flow? It means it's laminar. You will learn in future courses that laminar flow is rarely ever used for heat transfer. It's sometimes used on the micro scale but never at large scale. And so you're unlikely to be in this regime for any practical design. So we need to look over a wider range of Reynolds numbers. So let's do that. If we look over a very wide range of Reynolds numbers, we find a relationship that looks like this. We start off at low Reynolds number with our Nusselt number around five and a half. But as soon as we enter the turbulent flow regime above Reynolds number 1500, 2000, we start to see there's a functional relationship between Nusselt number and Reynolds number for constant Prandtl number. So, in effect, we have two heat transfer regimes. We have the heat transfer regime in the laminar flow region, which is a constant Nusselt number. We have the heat transfer regime in the turbulent flow regime, which is fun has a functional form between Nusselt number and Reynolds number. So, we need to be careful now. Let's think about the relationship that we derived from dimensional analysis and apply it to regime one. Regime one was our laminar flow case, a constant Nusselt number. So pi two, which is our Nusselt number in this case, is just around 5.5. So we can see that if alpha one equals beta one equals zero, pi one and pi three are removed from the first term on the right hand side and we simply set our numerical constant C1 to be 5.5 for regime 1. Let's think about regime 2, turbulent flow, where we have that functional relationship between Nusselt and Reynolds number. I'm going to explore this by firstly saying, well, let's subtract 5.5 from my Nusselt number. So the left-hand side now 
is my Nusselt number pi 2 minus the value that it had, that constant value in regime 1. So pi 2 minus 5.5. And that's going to be equal to the higher order terms in our series on the right hand side. So let's try plotting log Nusselt minus 5.5 as a function of log of Reynolds number and see what we get. This is just an experiment. So if we plot those two parameters together over a range of values we sort of get a straight line. So over this range here we can say that log of pi 2 minus 5.5 is 0.8537 log pi 1 minus 8.077. So that drops out of a regression from the experimental data. Right, let's feed that information back into our dimensional analysis. So, in blue, I have got the result we previously obtained. Pi 2 minus 5.5 is going to be the sum of the higher order terms. We're comparing that in purple with the regression that we got from our experimental data. Log pi 2 minus 5.5 is 0.8537 log pi 1 minus 8.077. So, let's see how this comparison weighs up. Let's assume for the time being, and we'll justify this assumption in a minute, that C3 and higher order values equal zero. And then let's compare what's in purple there with what's in blue. So we can see that in blue, we've grouped together log C2 pi 3 to the beta 2. Pi 3 is our Prandtl number, which is constant. C2 is a constant. Beta 2 we're going to have to make an assumption about. But that's going to make up a number. That's added to alpha 2 plus log pi 1, which we're going to compare to the log pi 1 term in purple. OK, so let's assume that beta 2 equals 1. Again, we will check that assumption and discuss it later. And look at the number. So on the left-hand side, we have minus 8.077. On the right-hand side, it has to be equal to log of that group of terms. We know an absolute value for pi 3. We've assumed a value for beta 2 that we'll discuss and check. And so what that gives us is a value of C2 of 0 0.0296. If we now look at the log term, alpha 2 log pi 1 has to equal 0.8537 log pi 1. Alpha 2 simply is 0.8537. So we've used the experimental data, manipulated the expression we obtained from dimensional analysis, compared the two, made a couple of assumptions that we need to check, and revealed a number for pi 2, C2, alpha 2. So, there's my theory from dimensional analysis. Let's use the information we've just obtained to create our correlation. So, pi 2, don't forget, was my Nusselt number. Let's put the 5.5 on the right-hand side. Pi 1 and pi 3, we know our Reynolds and Prandtl numbers. We know their indices and we know the constant C2. So, this is the correlation we're proposing, having made a couple of assumptions. We've assumed that the index of Prandtl number is 1, and we've assumed that terms involving C3 and higher are negligible. So, what are we going to do? Well, we'll look in the literature and we'll compare this result with a literature result that looks different, which might make us a little downhearted. Let's plot the two out. So, the literature correlation is in blue, the correlation we've derived is in brown, and they overlay almost perfectly. This is good. So our dimensional analysis has been correct, but let's revisit the assumptions that we made, specifically that beta 2 equals 1, which was the power of the Prandtl number. In literature, actually, there's another dimensionless group that gets used. Rather than using Reynolds number and Prandtl number individually for heat transfer problems, they actually merge together to form something called a Peclé number, which we're not going to worry about on this course. But what that means is that the index for the Reynolds number and the index for the Prandtl number should actually be the same, and we chose them to be different which is why we got a different value for our numerical constant. However, the method and the analysis that we used was perfectly good and gave us a good answer. So we're able to construct a correlation to predict heat transfer 
in fast breeder nuclear reactors. Let's recap a few key points. This example was intended to demonstrate all the techniques that we've developed so far. Many physical processes can have more than one regime. Please remember that. The only way to discover how these regimes change, or whether even they, they exist, is plot out experimental data. You can use dimensional analysis to inform your experimental design, which we did in this example, and if we're careful about how we process that experimental data, we can feed that back into dimensional analysis to produce a correlation that gives us predictive capability for physical phenomena.